Hello and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 165. My name is Danny Beaumont and I'm a Principal Product Manager on the Adobe Muse team. I am joined by, I think, no one from the team at the moment. So um, I'm going to keep an eye on chat today. There may be someone coming. It's still just top of the hour after all. And uh, if so, please put questions that you have for me in the, in the uh, presenter pod in the lower left, lower right lower left. Sorry, I'm having a slow morning. You're welcome to chat up above. And if you do have um, just comments that are off topic, you're welcome to throw that into the chat. And as I mentioned, I will um, stop and address it as we go along. So with that said, let's start our session. Today we're focusing on typography, the wonderful world of type. Let me get my act together here real quick. And as usual, I have a, a number of resources available for this session. If you're watching the YouTube recording, you'll probably just want to type in that tiny URL there on the left-hand side. Um, but I will kind of rely on this a little bit today. As usual, when I'm researching a topic, I kind of surf, surf the web for things that I think are relevant. And this is really just my speaker notes um, and topics around typography. Uh, not unlike many other aspects of Muse, type is definitely an area where I feel that you as a designer have a huge obligation, and that's to do wonderful design work, to learn best practices around typography, and learn about the medium in which you're working. So if you uh, were came from the world of print, it's kind of the world that I came from, I remember when I first had to learn to do things like a trifold brochure versus a magazine versus a book. You have to learn how that medium works and how to work within the confines of that medium, how to make a trifold brochure structured in a way that's an organized and appropriate way to communicate the information. When it comes to typography, um, there are distinct rules that are specific to the medium that you're working in. So if you do come from the world of print, things like text never smaller than 16 points if you can help it, because it's very difficult to read that on a screen, on a device. The fact that the web has exploded to so many platforms and so many devices means that you need to try to create content that's going to adapt to all of those environments. And we'll talk about that um, as we look at the Muse application and designing for tablet, smartphone, and desktop. But let's kind of, this is going to be a from the ground up session. Um, and if you're watching the recording, you can scrub ahead to the more sophisticated parts if you're a Muse master. Um, but I think it's always really good to talk about typography because it's a little odd. Um, I'll digress for just a second here. Um, I did study typography in school, um, and I was a product manager for a type library. Um, and I did some letterpress work. And it's always funny to me where words like uppercase and lowercase came from actual cases of type. So you would grab the uppercase letters from the uppercases because they were the big ones and the lowercase were in the bottom drawer. Letting and um, used to be slugs of lead to separate out lines. It's funny because I think our world really doesn't differentiate between what's a font and what is a typeface. Um, they've really blurred those lines. but. In the world of the web, there are distinct attributes about different types of fonts that we expose within the application. So let's just kind of, as I mentioned, start from scratch a little bit. I'm going to go on over and um, grab a little bit of text. I thought we'd be silly today and do um, puppy lorem ipsum. So we'll grab a chunk of text here. Just to make life simple, I'm going to copy and paste that into Muse. So I've got a simple text container here that I'm working with. And it's very incredibly unformatted. Let's assume for a moment I might have a headline here. So I'm going to grab that headline and place that into a separate container. Now, with each of the typographic options that you have within the application, there are going to be some trade-offs. And I want to talk about those. Many of you um, have heard, but you may not. Um, that in June of this year, we just added support for the full paid Typekit library, which is over 2,000 fonts in that Typekit premium 
um, library that are available to you now within Muse. This is epic, if you ask me, um, because I, I always laugh when coders are building websites or designers are trying to build a website and they have to code it, because it's such an out-of-body experience to try to assume what you're doing, the cascading style sheet or the HTML code um, or the JavaScript effects, all of these esoteric things that you do to code so that they c come together on the fly in a browser. And Muse really allows you to visually see some of these amazing techniques on a design canvas. We did that with scroll effects for the first time. Only hand coders were able to apply scroll effects to objects. And around typography, I just, I guess, I'm still impressed with the fact that you have access to these 2,000 typekit faces, um, and you can do it on a design canvas on the fly and actually see what you're doing before you have to publish it or preview it in the browser. So. Um, with that said, let's kind of start at the bottom. So I'm going to select some text here and type T on the keyboard to bring up my text tool and my text drop down here. Now you'll notice that we break it into four distinct categories. I believe there's four here, maybe three. We'll have to take a look. But we'll start with the bottom, and that's system fonts. So this was kind of the, the world before the evolution of web fonts. And the idea is that in my system folder, I may have some fonts that I've created or selected or that I work with, I probably use these in applications like InDesign or Photoshop. And I can come in, many of these fonts are actually web versions as well, but some are just desktop fonts. Um, I'm going to try to pick something here. Let's try Connecticut Italic. Can't swear, it's only for um, print. But I'm going to go ahead and select that. And you'll notice that I get a visual indicator here that's letting me know that what I've just selected is going to be rasterized. It's going to be flattened. It's as though I'm working in Photoshop, and I just typeset this text. And the text will appear as an image. This is your worst case scenario. This is something you don't really want to do, and we're going to talk about why. Um, but sometimes, let's say you've got a client that has a typeface that only exists as a desktop font, and you need to render little bits of text that are there. Um, let's go ahead and I'm just going to, let's just think here. Let's make this shorter just for good measure, and let's make it larger. Um, and let's go ahead and set this to the same typeface. Notice that under the recently used fonts area, I see the last typeface I've selected, making my life a little easier in my sleepy state this morning. All right, so I've got a headline. We'll make it a little larger for good measure. And um, without further ado, if you are stuck in this scenario, if you have to choose a font that only exists as a desktop font, Muse does do one really good thing for you. I'm going to come in. Let's just do a comparison real quickly here. I'm going to select these two objects, and I'm just going to press and drag off. Um, let's do it without the Scooby Snack here, make it a little smaller. And bring this guy over. So let's say we did a side-by-side -side comparison with these two text objects selected. Let me go in and select a different type of font. So I'm going to type T on the keyboard again, and I'm going to select um, something in the web font category. So these are typefaces that I have selected, and we're going to show how I did that. But I'm going to go ahead with the alternate Gothic number 2. Actually, let's go with a web font. We'll just use um, Alice. Wow. Alice is kind of big and odd looking here. Let's choose somebody else. Not feeling you today, Alice. Let's go with Birch. OK. Also kind of makes my eyes hurt. <clears throat> but with these two rendered, um, let me come in first. I'm going to delete this guy. And I'm going to preview in browser what I have. So I mentioned that I've selected a system font. I see this raster indicator here. When I pull down on File to preview the page in the browser, what happens is Muse is going to render the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And if I come in and make sure my view is set to actual size in the browser, I can see what that text is going to look like. Now, because we're talking about a flattened image, when I zoom in tight on this guy, it starts to look pretty awful. So if I were on a high-resolution, high-DPI device, um, and I scaled in on it, I'm not going to get dynamic scaling. It's not like vector content. It's going to be very raster, very um, image-specific. 
The good thing that Muse does do if you are forced to do this is let's say I'm um, visually impaired and I'm using a screen reader and I want to know what this text says. Um, or I'm Google and I'm crawling your website and you happen to have to use this particular typeface on some important text that you'd like Google to pay attention to, um, but you've fattened it out as an image. If I right click on the page here and go to view the page source, what you'll see is um, in the text here, notice I've got something known as an alt tag or alternate text. Alt tags um, are HTML content that will be injected into the code that actually look at that image now and make sure that it's represented as HTML. So here's the full text, Tigger, Tabby, Feeder, Doghouse. Um, even though it will be represented as an image, it's going to also be there for screen readers and for search engines um, as HTML in the code. So if you're forced to do that, we will handle that for you. Notice that what's being rendered, though, here is a PNG file with the text. So I can see that headline there. All right, this is the sad, awful world. And Muse shipped with something slightly more than that, which was, um, let's kind of actually take things in baby steps. So the next best world, I would say, which is not much better, is um, something that's usually known as web safe fonts. We renamed it to call it standard fonts with fallbacks. I think I lost track of why we thought this was a better name, but I'm going to go ahead and venture to guess um, it's because there's no such thing as web safe fonts. Um, the idea with that is it's a limited set that every device, so every phone, every computer, every tablet, has a font that relates to that let's say. But something tricky about these standard fonts, you'll notice, is they have something called fallbacks. So it'll say with fallbacks. And that basically is saying, guess what? If you're on Arial and you're on a PC and you swing over to a Macintosh, let's say an Apple device, um, it will substitute Arial with Helvetica New and so forth. So the fallback will fall back to any of the other fonts in that classification if they're available on that device. And if all else fails, it'll say, hey, any sense error font, if you're there, I'm going to use you. Now, you can do a little research on this, but the hard part about it is that there really is no consistency anymore with so many browsers and devices. These standard fonts tend to be really unstandard out there in the world. But they do have one advantage over system fonts. Let's go ahead and select Georgia here. Again, that's a little mighty large for me today. So let me come in and make a change on that. Hmm. OK. And now when we come on in and preview in the browser, let's just do a side-by-side -side comparison. So if I go back to view this at actual size, I see the two bits of text. And in that first instance, remember how this is an image. I can drag it around. Um, this is also an image. If I zoom in on it, it's going to look like hell. Um, this font to the left, that's the right, um, this font to the right um, is a font. So it is resolution independent. Um, it will automatically res up to the device I'm looking at. If it's a high DPI device, if it's a 4x resolution device, it's going to always render at that resolution. And it's highly likely that depending on the amount of text you have on a page, it's going to load much more quickly than a whole bunch of images would. So if I come in and zoom on this, it's really easy without getting everybody nauseous to see how this is going to degrade, yet this will stay clean and clear no matter how large the world is. All right, baby steps. Let's kind of bring these guys down to the bottom. And I'm going to grab this first guy and bring up a, a copy here. Let's talk about the next level of text. So for a while, I, I forget because Muse is a whole hunker three years old, but we've updated it 12 times in those three years. We're working on Lucky 13 um, towards the fall time frame. And uh, therefore, um, it's all a blur, especially on a morning like this when I'm feeling fuzzy. But uh, probably a year and a half ago, we added support for something known as Edge Web Fonts. And that is basically, if you kind of want to know the back end secret, if you go to Google Web Fonts, 
This is a Google interface for this, and it's kind of an open source project. It's geared towards the web. No one makes money from this, and it allows hand coders to have about 500 typefaces, many of which come from Adobe and Typekit, but they're donated to the cause. And you can reliably use these without any licensing, without having, um, without any money changing hands. So these offer many more designs um, than they are available in Muse and have been for quite some time. So if I want to use one of those fonts, I'm going to come on in under File, and I'm going to select Add and Remove Fonts here, Add, Remove Web Fonts. I can also do that from the drop down. Now you'll notice, um, as of June, we added this Typekit Premium Web Font Library in addition to the Edge Web Font Library that we've offered for a while. And this helps you get acclimated to that. I'll go ahead and close that and click on the Edge Web Fonts area. So here are those five, 600 fonts. I can get a quick preview of that typeface. I can search for a name if I know what I'm looking for. And I can come in and select it. So good old Aquafina script um, and a little bit of, jeez, <laughs> who wants giddy up standard? Nobody. Um, how about a henny penny? Equally scary. I'm just going to select it and click OK. Now an interesting thing happens when I do that. I get an alert telling me that two font families are added to the web font menu. What this means is if I look in my system folder, kindly enough, Giddy Up is not going to be there. It is not resident on my machine as a system font. That means that if I go to Illustrator or InDesign or Photoshop, I'm not going to see it there. But what this also means is that within Muse, I have a dynamically generated instance of that font. If I, job, if I were to apply Giddy Up to this text, save the file, and then later get on an airplane where I have no internet access, that runtime instance of Giddy Up is associated with my Muse file. So it will be there whenever I open up Muse because I've added it to my drop down list, it will be there for me, even when I don't have internet access. And when um, I give this file to a colleague, they open it up. They don't have to go in and grab a font. It will dynamically load on its own. They do need to have internet access that first time. But it's going to go ahead and make a query to the Typekit servers, where we're serving up this open source library, this Edge web font library, and drag it and apply it into my application. So with that said, I've got these guys selected. I can come on in and go ahead to my web font area. And um, good old Giddy Up is here, I'm sure of it. Oh, well, there's Henny Penny. We can go with that. Equally as scary. <laughs> Let's make it a little smaller. So, uh, fine. I'm able to work with that. Again, no licensing, no issues. Um, let's go ahead and relieve ourselves and go ahead and do one level deeper. So I'm going to come on in and dupe this guy out. And very similarly, um, I have capabilities now to deal with the premium Typekit library. So when I come on now, um, there's web fonts, recently used web fonts, standard, and then system fonts. So yes, there are indeed the four categories. So recently used is the one that I forgot. Um, up at the top of the web font section, I can come in and add web fonts. And I'll go ahead and do that. And indeed, um, I can access the Edge web fonts and the full Typekit library. Some interesting nuances here. So if you license the Creative Cloud, you are free to come in and build a website with one of these 2,000 fonts. Let's say your client and you um, have a falling out six months later. You've got a live site. You've got a Creative Cloud license. If you were to um, cancel your license or you were to no longer be affiliated with that client, um, those sites and those fonts will remain OK. The only time you probably would be concerned about licensing is probably not the world that you or I live in. But let's say I work for Gap.com, and I'm using a particular font, and I'm getting millions and millions of hits on that site. There's a chance that the Typekit folks will reach out and say, look, the threshold of millions of typefaces has been hit, and you're going to need to um, have an extended license. But the threshold is very, very high, and I think there's details about it on the typekit.com website. Generally speaking, once you set this up and publish it, that license will be intact. Now, for any of you that have worked with Typekit fonts in the past, it's pretty tricky. You have to go in and build a kit and associate it with a domain. Now, when you do that, 
There's an interesting interface. I would show it, but I don't think it's that relevant. If you've been there, you kind of are familiar with it. But as you come into a family of a font, let's go ahead and look here in the Typekit area. Let's say I'm shopping for a font. I've got some nice selection tools now in this interface. I can come in and say, you know, I'm looking for body text because goodness knows the, <laughs> the faces. Henny Penny is not really great body text. So I can limit my list to recommended for body text. I can decide if I want serif or sans serif. And as I do that, it's going to start to limit the range of typefaces I can see. I may want old style characters in addition to everything. So I can come on in. And you'll notice I'm seeing just a few fonts now that are available. Um, for each of the faces that I have selected, I can also see how many weights are now associated with that font. So let's say I go to Garvis Pro and click in on that. If I click in the lower area, it's going to show me each of the individual weights. I can take a look at it. But interestingly enough, if I come in and select this typeface, so I'm going to click it to select it and then click OK, it's going to add that family to my project. Now, we noted that that family had four weights. The four weights are present within Muse. But as a designer, if I come in and only use one weight, let's say just the body text weight, I don't have to worry about my kit, in essence, because Typekit is going to, at Typekit and Muse as they work together, is going to only subset the fonts that are actively being used in the design. So the kit that is dynamically generated is not going to be kit for all weights and add a lot of overhead to the site. I can come in now, select from that area, and come in and choose the font. So I'll come to my drop down if I can click right here. And um, I can peruse what I've got here. You'll notice I also have nice icons now that indicate what foundry these come from. I kind of find this to be interesting and then a lot of clutter after a while. So there is a preference where you can come in and say, you know what, go ahead and hide the logos for me. Um, if I come into a family that I want to work with here, let's just see. Let's say I go with Garvis Pro. Here are all the weights I can work with. I might select italic, um, and I'll bring it down to a more reasonable size, let's say 18 points. Um, I can see it. It's all here. It's easy to work with. As I mentioned, if I send this to a colleague, they'll see it and work with it. And now when I preview in browser, it's going to render that. So uh, there is a Muse designer that I've worked with for a few years. Um, he and I discovered each other from Sight of the Day a couple years back, but he's here in San Francisco. And he did me a favor. He heard about the Typekit release that was coming up. And he um, created an incredible experiment with Typekit and Muse together. And um, the site is at sessionswithtypography.com. I'm going to go ahead and copy this into the chat section because there's really, I think, value to loading it up on your own machine just as sort of a proof of concept. Um, you don't have to do it right now. Uh, but Sessions with Typography, as you scroll down, um, allows you to really explore the Typekit premium library. I can come to any of the weight sections here and just click it, and it's going to scroll to that section. There's also some hidden little links that you can scroll from spot to spot. The reason why this is an interesting site is if you scroll all the way down with the heart here to the very bottom, um, give a little love to Aaron Lawrence. He did this. Um, he works for Pivotal Labs here in San Francisco. But there's a call out that says, kids, don't try this at home. Um, we are not advocating that one should do this. But this page has 49 fonts with 62 weights and five different styles applied. Um, it goes on and on and on. And depending on where you're loading it and depending on what your internet access is like, it may or may not be an amazing experience. Never, never put 65 different weights in a single page. But just knowing that if you did, um, both the Typekit server and Adobe Muse are rendering clean, fast code that can load such a heavy site very easily. So. Um, yeah, I just think it's a terrific proof of concept. The mobile version, the phone version, has a subset because phones tend to have limited bandwidth and screen size. But this is all live type. You can select it all. You can see it all. And then Aaron goes into some type treatments that I'd like to talk about now. So some of the ways that you work with web fonts I think is interesting. Um, some of the things he's done here, like shadows, I'd like to talk about a little bit now. So before I jump into that, I'm going to check on chat. 
and just see how folks are going. Um, let's see. So we got a, um, a little bit, we're going to step out for a second here from the topic. How can I add a link button to the caption on a hero slideshow? Um, it's a little confusing, uh, but there are two ways to do a slideshow. If you do a standard slideshow, it's quick, it's easy, um, and it works well. Let me give you a little visuals here. So if I come in, let's just build a new page real quickly here. I will only digress briefly, but that's why it's a jam session. You guys control what we talk about it pretty much, maybe not entirely as much as I do, but somewhat. <laughs> if I come to the slideshow section, I can press and drag a slideshow here, and then I can add objects into that slideshow. And what this person is asking is, how do I link the caption? So if I come in and say tulips on Tuesday, and I select that text, why can't I get to the hyperlink area? Maybe I can. That's interesting. And then hit enter. So I'm able to add a link to my caption there, which I believe is the nature of the question. A link button to the caption on a hero slideshow. Let's assume for a moment you're asking for more of a button. Okay, so I can link some text here. I can add an image, but I can't really do much of anything else. It's a slideshow and it's nice. And part of the good part about that, the upside is that it's automatically gen, rent, gen, uh, rendering thumbnails for me here that I can then click through each of the images. All right, that's option one with the slideshow widget. If instead I select a composition widget called, um, doesn't really matter, I can go in and select the blank composition widget here. And then in my options, I may come in and say that I want yeah, doesn't really matter. I'm going to leave this as is. I could have a close button if I wanted to actually go in and create a lightbox instance. Um, and you can tr control some of how these attributes work. But let's say I'm shooting for a similar um, scenario to what we've got down below. So I'll come on in and grab some images kind of quick. Let's do this. Never grab images that you don't know what they will be. I'm still here, thinking hard. All right, grab a couple graphics. And I'm going to place them here. So I've got one. And you'll notice that it's rules about how it places a little bit. This is really just a container, an image container. Um, but I can come in as I work with that container. See if I did this right. I can put it in here. I can grow it to fit. And I can also even copy and paste that image into my thumbnail. At the end of the day, the advantage to this, so it may take a little more fiddling. Um, in fact, the way I probably should do this is to select the container and then under add image, fill it with my image. I can have it scale to fill, for example. Um, and then I can do the same for my thumbnails. The opportunity though is let's say you wanted to add a caption. So I can simply come in and add captions here. Let's say I've got a text container here. Grab a little bit of text. I'm going to add it into this area. We'll go ahead and add that text as, you know, we can let it be black text and we'll give it a, a fill in the background of white. That I'll set with, um, let's try this, go here, fill with white, and I'm gonna set it to be a little bit transparent, translucent here. So I could go on, but basically this container can be anything I want it to be. So if I wanted this to be a button, I wanted to have up over down states, um, I can put anything I want. I could put a video in here. I could put images that I link out. So long story short, um, the composition widget allows you to nest inside of it other widgets or other elements um, that can link out to other bits. The slideshow widget is a little more auto magic um, and simpler to work with, but it doesn't allow that sort of nesting. Hopefully that answers the question. Hello, Mr. Pordelli. You're in charge of chat now. 
Okay. How to get new words into the Muse Dictionary? It's a good question. So let's go back. I'm not positive, but I'm open to um, checking into it with you. I believe the way the world works is if I come here and Tigger obviously has not made the grade. So if I right click on Tigger, um, the way uh, dictionaries work is very interesting. If you're only using one language and um, Muse is running in that language, your world is probably pretty good. If you tend to work in mixed languages, let's say for some odd reason I needed to translate the ticker text to Spanish, which we could. I don't know how good a mood everybody's in here for a minute. Let's try to be funny. It won't take long. So translate English. Spanish. Are we having fun yet? OK, bring it on. Tabby Tigger doesn't seem to translate that well. But notice I now have English and Spanish here. And a lot of spelling errors now, because that's not very good English, obviously, because it's Spanish. What I can do is under Site Properties, I can come in and select the language I want to work on. So under Content, notice the language here. This is the global language that will be applied to everything in the site by default. So I may be running on an Irish operating system and want to use American English. Um, that's fine. Once I've done that on a per item, per paragraph basis, I can select this container, right click to it, and notice here I can select language. So it's selecting what's either the, notice here, actually you can do it at a site level. You can do a page level, which is probably more realistic. Let's say you have a site and you're doing it in three languages. Um, you can, on individual pages, select what the default language that is applied to that would be. Um, the page language is English, which is great. But what I want to do is select the second container, right click on it, and under language, go ahead and change it to Spanish. Now, when I do so, a lot of the text is then good. The question was, what happens if Tigger's not in my dictionary? Select the word that's giving you this little squiggly. If the squiggly's driving you crazy, under View, you can turn off the spelling indicators. So at some point, once you know your spelling's good and it's hurting your eyes, you can turn it off. But with that selected, you can just come on in and add Tigger to your dictionary. You can either add it to the English dictionary or the global dictionary. So hopefully that answers your question. Now you may wonder how you get Tigger out of your dictionary. I think we haven't supported that yet. So you better really want Tigger in your dictionary before you add it. Um, I think you can replace the dictionary, but I don't believe we've given you the ability yet to remove words you've added. There's a tip for you. OK. Oh, phew. nobody told me Abhishek was coming today. Abhishek's going to call me a liar, but this is why it's a jam session, because when I entice our amazing engineers into the sessions, um, they fill me in. Ah, so Mr. Abhishek, thank you. <coughs> All right, now i got to get on my game. i got a lot of people smarter than me here. So let's say I add Tigger to the dictionary, made a mistake. Um, I can go to, although, why is Tigger still mad at me? Add Tigger to the English dictionary. That's interesting. It's ignoring me. Having added it, um, I can come in and go to spelling, bring up my user dictionary, and there's my good friend Tigger that can be removed. Not sure why the squiggly stayed, though, but I'm sure Abhishek knows more. OK. On to any other quick random questions. Is there a way to add a print button to a Muse page? I can let Allie take that one. I am sure there is embed code that could probably do that. It's probably tricky based on what device it is that they're viewing it. Um, probably custom code would get you there. Um, <clears throat> how to set targets and links to parent, etc., directly within Muse with the only option inside app being new window? Um, it's a good question. I think that I have done work myself with um, putting custom HTML in the hyperlink area. So for example, you can say bring up a mail to, um, which would bring up a mail client. And you can title the email with a name that's appropriate. And you can even fill in the body of the email message with, hi, George, 
I'm really interested in your blah, 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 and allow them to fill in those details. I would explore looking at some custom hyperlink code that either calls to the parent. I could be wrong, and if Abhishek or Ali know better. Yeah, he's talking print button for you here, which is good. Okay, I am going to go back to our main topic. Okay, beautiful mess that we have here. So let's talk about some of the things that I think are interesting. Um, there are nuances around working with the web. And Abhishek knows that I paddled into his office about four months ago and said, hey, we've got this incredible thing called fonts within Muse. Um, can we do all these crazy things? And to a large extent, the answer is no. Um, we can have beautiful premium fonts that you can use, but we're always constrained by the consistency with which web browsers are gonna render what you're doing. And our core belief is that you want to know that what you see in the design canvas will behave across even things as ancient as Internet Explorer. So we will do graceful degradation um, for older browsers, and there's a range that we commit to supporting. And as such, we're trying to work very hard to make sure that typographically we um, always give you a consistent behavior, which means there are some things that you cannot do as much um, using Muse as you would perhaps as a hand coder. The thing that I want to point out with is even those hand coders may have an amazing looking website, but it's not going to be consistently amazing across all browsers. Um, it's pretty difficult to do that. So let's talk about some of the nuances and how you start to trade off some of these options. So we've got um, kind of some silly text going on here, but let's say I wanted to add some effects to this. Um, if I wanted kibble to be fun and interesting, one kind of simple uh, thing that we're seeing on the web, if we go back to sessions and typography, um, what Aaron did to be playful a little bit in his design. If I can scroll on down here and let's go to this first section. Notice he's got some nice little shadowing going on here. You can easily simply do this by selecting your text. I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to, in essence, come in and paste in place. And then I'm going to shift, let's say, one, two, three times on the keyboard left, one, two, three down. And I may come in and apply. I'll type T on the keyboard and then select that text and make sure that I give it a different shade. We'll do something rather boring. We'll just do gray. And then I'll just want to make sure that when it's layered, I send it to the back. And I can fiddle to get a nice alignment there as I'm working based on the font and the weight that I'm working with. And that works pretty consistently across browsers and platforms for the most part. Um, if I want to come in and stroke text, you can't do that in Muse directly. What you can do, and this is where the world is interesting, is if you have an illustrator in your portfolio, go ahead and take the text and let's, again, let's just try this really quick. All right, I'm going to come in. This may or may not go well for me. I know I don't have Henny Penny loaded right now in Illustrator, but let's just bring in Illustrator. All right, I'm going to not go there. I'm going to stay safe, which is when you are an Illustrator and you select some text, you can convert to paths or convert to outlines. Once you've done that, you can come in and stroke the text. You can fill the text. You can give it a pattern. Um, and when you're working, what you can do at that point is either copy it to the clipboard and paste it into Muse. Doing that will bring it in as SVG. You can also export from Illustrator to SVG. Let's, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Life is short. So I'm going to bring up Illustrator. See how quickly I can get door to door here. So for a long time, for about two years, the only way you could do anything I'm showing you from Illustrator was to save for web, which would be to flatten it out and make it a graphic, um, which got you in all that same um, trouble that you get with working with Photoshop, for example. All right, I've got my little kibble here. And as I mentioned, I'm not going to have that same typeface loaded. But I can come on in and have something very large and see if I can come up with something rather equally scary. 
I'm going to come in and pick something kind of funny. Now here I don't really care if it is a desktop font. That's perfectly fine. And many of the Typekit fonts will have desktop pairings. And as part of your Creative Cloud license, you can work with that. Let's say I'm working with this design here, and I want to see, I want to do something a little heavier for what we're going to show. Oh, let's go retro. Wide Latin. No, we can't. It's too painful. <laughs> okay. With this selected here, what I can do is come in and under type. I can create outlines. Once I've done that, I can have at it. So I may come in and stroke and fill these objects with something different. So let's say I've got it and I want to come in and Maybe I can just add a funny stroke. I think I can. So if I wanted to, let's just see here. You can see how much I know, don't know Illustrator any longer. Oh, getting good and scary. Are you frightened yet? OK, let's pretend I thought this was a good idea. Obviously, it is not. I've got a little funny thing going on with my path here. I'm not sure why that happened, but I could come in and join them. We'll let it be for now. Let's say I thought that was amazing and was a good idea. All I need to do is copy here, Command C, swing back over into Muse, and paste it. Notice as it renders in here, this is an SVG. It's scalable vector graphics, which means it is as first class a citizen as any of the other text on this very beautiful page. Its downside, though, let's just kind of Go ahead and isolate this again for a moment. I'm going to come into a clean page. This is what I love. I'm not a coder, but I can see the code that Muse is generating, and I learn a lot from that code by looking at the source. So if I preview in browser, there's beautiful kibble in all its glory. I can zoom on it and see all these scary little edges. Um, I can zoom back. If I right mouse and say um, view page source, what I'm not getting is the word kibble. If I say find kibble, I can't find it anywhere here, which means a screen reader is not going to find it, and Google's not going to find it. What I can do is, with this object selected, I can come in and, let's see. With it selected here, I'm going to go to Edit Image Properties. I can define an alt tag or alt text. So I say, kibble, it's great. Click OK. Preview in browser, look at my horrendous design, view page source, and now when I find the word kibble, indeed it is there as HTML text so that screen readers and search engines are going to take advantage of it. So there is really not a huge consequence to going to Illustrator, saving it out as SVG, and bringing it in. Um, SVG is beautiful because even if you have alternate layouts, phone, desktop, and tablet, that SVG instance will be uploaded once and reused across your devices. So there's no speed um, issue with it. It will scale dynamically and work really well. Kind of um, going into that world of custom just a little bit further. Let's say this is great, but um, you want to work with icons, kind of a variation on text a little bit. Um, and even if I come and look at Aaron's design here a little bit, he's got some fun little elements that he's got placed here. So if I come in and look under humanism here, this is actually an SVG element. Maybe it's not. This guy looks like it's resolution dependent, but he does have some SVG bits here um, that I could use in that same way that we just showed you. Let's talk about another world a little bit, which is um, icons. So as you work, you have a trade-off of how you might want to deal with some icons. And let me give you a couple examples here. So if I'm back within Muse, and I go to another clean, safe page, let's get rid of beautiful kibble, and I want to add some icons to my design. Um, let's just see. If I go into Ikes, I'm going to just search for some SVGs that I've got here that I can work with. So 
Seems like I had some icons. Mm, pretty simple ones, but it'll do. Say I want to work with this bicycle as an SVG. And this might be, it's obviously a little crooked, but it doesn't really matter. Let's pretend I wanted it in this way. And this is an icon that I'm going to use throughout my design. There's a kind of a couple ways that you can weigh your options. Um, you can either use SVGs and bring them over. To colorize the SVG, though, if there's a certain value color, notice that this bicycle has a color associated with it. If I want to apply a color, I need to go to Illustrator and set that value before I bring it over. Now, as I'm working within Muse, I may have a good color set already defined. Um, I can always pull up my values from my swatch set. Let's say I thought this was dreamy. Um, if I come into Swatch Options, I can go and grab the hex value here and apply it in Illustrator. But it's kind of convoluted, and it's sort of an extra step. Another way you can work is if you're using icons, and kind of prudently, um, you can come in. Let's just see if I can get to this now easily. Hmm. I seem to tend to have a set of icons. I haven't seen them in a while, so let's see if I can pull these up. Let's try this bucket here for a minute. All right, this is going to be a pretty sorry example, but it'll do the job. So let's say I wanted to um, work with this. We're going to pretend like this is an icon that I might want to work with. And it is resolution dependent. So I could save it at 2x or twice the resolution and scale it down to 50% so that I know that high resolution devices will work with it. Um, the advantage I have is if I come to this object, I cannot colorize it. If I say, hey, make it green, mm, it's not really what I meant. I kind of wanted the bicycle to be green. Um, I don't really have that option. If I select a raster file, an image file that's saved out, and it's small and it loads pretty lightly, I can come under Effects to an area here, Glow. This is actually Ollie Pordelli's fault. He discovered this before anybody else on the Muse team was aware of it. Um, I can come in and select a color, set the opacity to 100%, the blur to 250, and then the key is to define an inner glow. Now, that's not looking all that fabulous because it's probably not a great source to work with. Um, but if I do have individual pretty clean icons, I can come in and colorize those. And if I'm using them throughout the site and I used a name swatch color, I can change that color. Another last way that I do want to mention that you can work is if there is a set of icons you use off, often, there's a really nice path to get there. So if I go to um, a site called Font Awesome, Font Awesome allows you to come in and select a common set of fonts that you're working with. So if I go to the Icons section, um, I can come and work with them and choose the ones that I want. I can even upload graphics of my own. So if I have SVGs from Illustrator, let's say it's my company logo, I can bring them in and add them as custom fonts and just really build out a set that I'd like. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try to come in and select some of these. I haven't been here in a while, and they may have changed their interface somewhat. But what will happen is you'll come in, select the set that you want, and then give it a name. And these are pretty broad range of all sorts of icons that are available. When you come in and give it a name, you can then save it out as what's known as a self-hosted font. And I've got, as I mentioned, a collection that I tend to work with. When I come in now, let me just take a look at that with you here. So I'm going to go out to my Finder. And in the self-hosting area, I have basically um, a font that I wanted to work with. So if I come in, we'll call it Danny Weather. And um, I went into Font Awesome, and I grabbed a bunch of different weather icons because I needed them for a project. And when I saved them out of Font Awesome, they delivered to me this Danny Weather zip file. And when I unzipped it, 
You'll notice that um, under the font section, there's some interesting little elements here. These are self-hosted web fonts. Another scenario is if you work with fonts.com or monotype and you have a self-hosted license and there's a typeface that's not in the Typekit Foundry and you want to have it available, defining it as a self-hosted font is a great way to do that. So the first thing I need to do though is notice there's Danny Weather TTF. That's a true type font. I'm going to double click it and there's my lovely little weather icons. I need to install it because the self-hosted font instance is going to rely on that system font to give me a preview. But it's not going to do that bad rasterizing of the font. It's just a way that it'll be previewed. So I've gone in and loaded that font in my system. Um, Abishek's welcome to talk, call me a liar, but I believe Muse is going to notice I've done that or not. <laughs> Let's see for a second. So what I'll do now is pull that under File to Add Files add and remove web fonts. Let's try that again. This is my last point, and then we're going to go to questions. Um, Self-hosted, I want to then come in and browse or locate that folder. I'm just going to go to the Finder and go to that self-hosted directory where I've got the Danny Weather font folder. I'm just going to grab the whole folder and just drag it into the area here. It says, great, I've got a WAF, an EOT, and an SVG. You don't really need to know what those are about, but Muse does. And what will happen is that will give you what you need to host the font. Now, Muse intelligently did notice that I added it to the system folder, so I didn't need to close and open Muse. It dynamically recognized the font is in my folder. And there's some details here. If the font you're working with requires licensing information, you can put it there. If it's going to track usage, you can put that page view tracking code. You're going to want to look at the licensing rules where, um, where that self-hosted font came from to make sure you adhere to it appropriately. I can click OK and then click OK again. And now, interestingly enough, as I'm working, if I want to play with that, I'm going to come under Window to the Glyphs panel and kind of drag this guy out here. And I'll come on in to I'll just create a text container. And I won't put anything in it for a moment. But I'm going to go under Entire Font. Hmm. I'm going to go here. Let's just see. And I should have that Danny script now loaded in here, or Danny Weather, I think it was called. So I can always type Danny. Not a lot of Dannys in here. There's Danny Weather. And it doesn't look like much, but with that glyphs panel open, I can say, well, it's looking a little thunderous outside, and render or create that guy and work with it. Um, in this case, I can also come in and just give it that fabulous um, shade of green, if I'd like, to colorize it. So it allows you, again, just to summarize that, let's say this My Font logo is my company's logo, and it's very precise. As long as I get it in a vector form, let's say I open it up in Illustrator, and I can save it as SVG, Font Awesome will allow you to take the SVG and create a font using that graphic. Once you've done that, you save it as self-hosted, bring it into your design, and then in this Glyphs panel, you can drag it out and have it persistently available um, whenever you need it as a typeface. You can colorize it very easily that way as well. All right, this is the wild world of type we've covered today. Um, any questions that I didn't cover that Ali didn't bail me out, or Colleen, or Abhishek, since it looks like we've got good coverage today. Um, any of the folks like Abhishek, if there's something that you want me to talk about, throw it into the chat real quick. As Abhishek says, you can even use icon fonts as bullets, which is sort of like a challenge, I think, since he's here. Let's say um, I wanted to do that real quickly, because that's what I'm all about. And we have a little bit of time. Let's get back to the text that we have. I'm just going to show what he's saying really quickly. So the good old kibble collection, Tigger Tabby. Copy that. And I'm going to go back to a blissfully empty page, paste that text in. Now, this, of course, is a list of cat and dog 
phrases, so I'll break them up as such, select all. I can come into my bullets list here. I can decide that I'd like to use bullets. Notice the new character section here. I can come into that Danny script font, Danny Weather. Select it. And click OK. Notice it says bullets and there's nothing. If I go entire font, it's because they're kind of stuck there um, in the entire font area. They're not in the bullet area. It wasn't necessarily designed as such. It's looking a little rainy, so I'm going to click OK. I now have that as a beautiful bulleted option here. I can even come into that bulleted list and decide I want it to have, <laughs> you guessed it, that beautiful shade of green. Um, that is independent from anything I'm doing with the text. So it is treated as a bullet. I could add spacing here very easily to loosen things up a little bit um, further. And a whole lot of customization there as well. So there you go, Abhishek. What else? Anything else that we can answer for you that we haven't covered? We've got about six minutes. I'm going to go ahead and swing over to the next area. It's always good to get feedback if this session met your expectations. Um, if it didn't, you're forced. If you say it fell below expectations, you are forced to tell me why in the chat pod. And I will call you out if you don't believe me. Trust me, I will. Um, two weeks from now, we're going to do a session on in-browser editing. We have some enhancements there around hyperlinks. So we'll do a session all about that. If there's topics you'd like to cover, um, please put it in the lower right-hand corner. We're always open to keeping this portfolio of stuff fresh. Um, in the last three months, everything we've recorded is available on YouTube, which means you can watch it on an iPad while you work within Muse um, if you'd like, or just have a little more flexibility and quality with the recordings. All right, it looks like we may have hit it. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and give you this connect link if you'd like it. And then if you do swing by YouTube or Facebook later today, you can watch the YouTube version. Thank you everyone for coming to these sessions. We learn a lot from you, as I mentioned. That's why it's a jam session, not just for the banjos. And um, always sending us your sites to Site of the Day it helps us immensely. Come join us at Max in October. Um, we're doing some amazing, amazing, exciting work. If you're not part of the private pre-release, it's a great time to join. Um, that would be at MusePreRelease.com. I'm going to put this in the chat. Uh, MusePreRelease.com, you have to agree to keep what you see there secret, but and also be open to running a version of Muse alongside your shipping version, just to play with, not for production. But it's a terrific way to influence the team and let us know what your thoughts are about features that we're developing. All right, I'm really stopping the recording. I will be right back.